Bonjour, bonsoir, dear friends. Welcome to JCB Live. Happy hour where we're going to stay in the wine country of California. We're going to meet one of the most youngest, exciting, charismatic, passionate, sixth generation Californian. His winery was founded in 1858, just a short year after Buena Vista Winery next to it. His name is Jeff Bunchu. I'm so thrilled because he really represents to me the very cool, exciting California boy. Studied at USC, of course. I went to UCLA, so big competition between the two. He's a great musician. He's an artist. He's all that you dream in the wine world and more. And what he's very good at, as we will see, he is very good at making an historical winery look young, relevant, and turn towards the future. So, dear friends, I'm very pleased to welcome the fabulous and charming Jeff Bunchu. Yes, there he is, John Charles. I, 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 I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm flabbergasted and humbled and a bit taken aback. You went to UCLA. I never knew that about you. <laughs> cheers. Well, cheers. <laughs> I never want to say that to you because you're probably a better school and much better educated than I am. So I was trying to hide all those years. Oh, I don't know. UCLA is nothing to laugh at. Uh, but uh, being from Northern California, anything anything south of uh, San Jose is a little suspect anyway, at least to my family. So, so here's to you. Thank you for having me. Well, to you. And it's, um, it's very true, you know, I, I'm reading a lot of Native American stories lately. And it's very interesting that the Indians, the Native American used to say, we should never populate south of California. There's no water. So I guess you're right. The North is the place. Well, there we go. I guess that, uh, that, that, that even validates it even more. Uh, so Jeff, you have an amazing winery, an incredible family tradition. How do we pronounce it? Well, if you have a long time and the elevator ride is long enough, you see, you say Gunlock Bunchu Winery. <laughs> if you're talking to your friends or people you uh, love or want to introduce, you can say Gun Bun. We, we answer to both. But Gunlock Bunchu are the name of my two, uh, my great, great grandfather and his son-in-law, my great, great grandfather, my great, great, great and great, great grandfather. They married together back then. But Gun Bun works plenty well. Yeah, they married together. It was kind of a very French Italian way. You married your cousin, huh? Uh, you know, effectively, it wasn't quite that way, but it was, uh, it was similar. They both, uh, you know, Jacob Gunlock had come over. We say Gunlock if we're speaking European, uh, but Gunlock, Gunlock is anglicized. But he came over. He was the fourth son in a small village in, a, in, a, the, uh, in southern Germany with a family that was educated and was in the wine and hotel business, but he was the youngest, and they didn't have anything to pass on to him. So he hightailed it to California, thinking he was going to, strike it rich in the gold rush and missed that by a year or two and but uh luckily opened up a brewery and soon enough started uh, selling beer enough to buy the property that we're on today and the rest oh, is so history he, the, the family history started as a brewery well it's actually both strangely both jacob jacob's family jacob gunlock's family was a was in the wine business with a little bit in fact he actually spent this is for a different time probably but a year in champagne in the 18 uh 30s i think before he got on this boat to head or it must have been the 40s before he before he head over to california but um it was a wine hotel business and then charles bunchu who was a german that he met in san francisco had come from, with a brewery background uh a wine and brewery background and they both i guess were opportunistic thinking that beer was going to sell more right off the bat to the thirsty gold miners <laughs> what a great story because you know, when you think about it, we are neighbors. We have Buena Vista. He came from Hungary as well. Yeah. So it was the big empire of the time, you know, the German, the Austrians and the Hungarians that that came here and really got established. Huh? It was definitely that it was very interesting and in that they, uh, you know, they came. They, there was enough of them uh, and, and enough traffic that my favorite story was, you know, Jacob got here in 1850. He established himself and then he went and he couldn't like before he left, the parents of his sweetheart would not grant him permission to marry her and take her along. So he left without her. But four years later, he went back to grab her and her parents let her go this time. Her name was uh, was Ava and Ava got to San Francisco and she would write home to Germany 
And she would say to her parents, oh, everything in San Francisco is great. I don't have to learn English because everybody speaks German and French. Uh, you know, so, yeah, like that's a direct quote. I don't have to learn English. Everybody knows German or French. So it was quite the cosmopolitan sort of city. And when you dive back into it, it was amazing to understand that while the time frame was longer, obviously, to get from point A to point B, there was still a ton of traffic coming from Europe to San Francisco and, and hence north to Sonoma and Napa. That's right. So he, he spent some time down there and then he discovered this amazing valley, that Sonoma area. And that was it. Then he started to build the, the building you're in front of. That's right. He, uh, you know, what, what, what he got a hold of, you know, he had known enough about wine growing in, in, in where he was in Germany to have an idea enough such that, you know, he got on his trip. It's another story. He got shipwrecked off the coast of, uh, well, he got, he got stuck in Brazil for a while. And he writes that he would have stayed there had there been any viticulture, but there wasn't, so he kept going. So he knew a little bit about what he was looking for, and he loved the maritime climate. He recognized the stuff that we do, you know, as neighbors, the fog from the Pacific Ocean and the proximity to the bay. Um, and he bought this with a couple partners there in, uh, you know, in 1858, and that's essentially what started. What was interesting about the business then was that this was sort of the outpost. They crushed the wine in this building here, um, but took the the uh, the must and the and the and the and the fermenting wine down by barge, what's now Sonoma Creek, and Sonoma Creek's barely navigable with a model boat now. But uh, they used to used to be the main way of commerce up here, and they would go down to the big wine building, which was in San Francisco until the 1906 earthquake. That's amazing. So you want to show us this incredible yeah, building? Yeah. So come on, I, I I can move now, and I'm going to grab a little bit you, of this. We haven't said anything about it yet, but I'm lucky to be sharing a little bit of these bubbles. Well, Alex, with you, we wanted to make sure today we we welcome you with, in fact, Napa bubbles, and this is, you know, uh, Carneros, which is very close to us. Yep. You know, literally a few miles away from your winery. And this is uh, Late Disgorge 2013. So it is delicious. It is, I mean, uh, you know, when, uh, when we became neighbors and I, I don't remember the year, but I believe you, you, you brought a, you somehow produced a magical sparkling wine the first year you came. It might even have been from your, the old country. Uh, and this is keeping up the tradition. It's excellent. I, you know, you. And I promise I've only had a glass. So it's actually me talking, not the wine. Uh, it's delicious. <laughs> so come on in. We're going. We're going. So basically, we're going to walk in. Um, that says Bonded Winery 64. So it's one of the oldest bonded wineries in California. And, you know, we're walking into what was the cellar. It's now sort of a, a showroom and a, and a tasting area. And post COVID, it's basically a showroom. But this uh, is where we started pouring wine here in the 70s when my father uh, reopened the winery after prohibition. There was a minute there where he had only been a, a, a wine grower. But I like to come in here and I, I've done this once before in a work. You tell me if it does or does not because there's a, fa a couple family pictures. Can you see that up there, Jean Charles? Absolutely. Yeah, we want to yeah. see. Yeah. So this that is, is that's the that's the board that's the boardroom in San Francisco before the earthquake um, of the of sort of the good looking men and unfortunately no women. Uh, that were the women were bosses. They just weren't in the picture. Uh, but that's them meeting and trying to figure out the wine business pre-prohibition. Um, and there's a, some of that stuff we still have in our family house up the road here. But then there's a couple great looking old guys there on the, the circle frame. Can you see that? Yeah, that's, for sure. That's, uh, With that's, a nice beard. Yeah, yeah that's Jakob, Jacob Gunlock right there. And that is his son-in-law, uh, Charles Bunchu in the big square. And basically... As I indicated, Jacob came to San Francisco and before long he needed some help and he found a, a guy who also had a history of winemaking and beer making in, San, in Germany, but he was in San Francisco and that was, that's Charles Bunchu. And of course, Charles being entre entrepreneurial and enterprising was young enough to eventually convince Jacob that he was a fine suitor for Jacob's daughter, Francesca. <laughs> and so that's exactly, that's what happened there. Francesca and Charles married and they had, uh, they had a son named Walter, and this is the part of the family where I'm really glad I got their brains and not their haircuts because both of those two guys don't have a lot of hair. But uh, <laughs> and you better show you better show us your hair because I know you have a, a I, lot I, of I, you know that's it. I, charming, I'm glad, certain that, blonde hair. 
that's Walter over there. And Walter and his brother Carl had to, they had the challenge of essentially growing up in a pretty prosperous business, but then as young teenagers watching it burn down in San Francisco uh, with the 1906 earthquake and fire. And so Walter and his brother Carl came here and restarted this winery uh, in Sonoma, uh, you know, basically expanded it so it could do everything on the property here. And his generation is interesting because Walter was lucky enough to marry Sadie and Sadie's family helped Walter sort of procure the family property of which I'm a very lucky, you know, recipient of. Um, but his brother Carl wasn't quite as lucky in terms of what he inherited. So he went over and became the first winemaker in Inglenook after John Daniels died at, uh, or pri I think pre John Daniels at, at Inglenook after Gustav Niebaum died. So That's if you amazing. go back in the early days of Napa, uh, you know, he was uh, apparently known for, they called him Whispering Carl because he was so loud when he was over there. He must have absolutely been a bunch of um, And that's <laughs> Toll, my grandfather. And, that, you know, he's the first one of these people that I remember. And he was, Toll was much more of a hero. Can you see him up there, John Charles? Yeah, oh um, yeah, absolutely. He, he basically, when Walter died young, Toll had to come home, sort of a young man. Uh, in the, he had just finished undergraduate school and he came home to tend the farm, so to speak. And Walter had died and with him a lot of institutional wine knowledge because prohibition had been there. So he had to go through a long period of his life, kind of protecting the property, getting the vineyards replanted, planting some other things, um, and really just essentially saved it for my father, Jim, who, you know, he's lucky, he's alive, so he doesn't have a picture up there yet. I'll find him around here somewhere. <laughs> uh, but very charming, man. You know, but basically Jim and, uh, you know, my dad convinced Toll, my grandfather, was that they could do it. And my grandfather at first didn't want to bestow all the family heritage on him until he was proved that he was serious. But that's what happened. He got serious. And, and really, at that point, you know, kind of or, or, or originated the rebirth of Gunlock Bunchu as we know it today. It, you know, the big pre-prohibition and it kind of went through three phases. One, it was a big producer. Lot. Yeah. By the time it burnt in San Francisco, it was about five times the size that we are now. And then it trickled along until prohibition. Then, then we became basically farmers, wine growers, and, uh, you know, mentored by some great people from Carl's Bunchy's universe, Louis Martini being primarily one of them. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and then Toll came along essentially and, 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 and held it. Jim Bunch, who comes of age watching Andrew Telechev and all the legends in Napa create fine wines in California and convinces Toll that we reopen. But instead of opening a sort of a come one, come all brandy and everything, it was a real focused on kind of an estate European tradition where kind of the simple vision was make sure you can see all the grapes from the, from the chateau, so to speak, and get them all in and process them all in the same place. And that's for many years what, what this was. A um, couple other things to point out. In case you need some inspiration for costume parties, I know you don't, John Charles, and maybe some of your, your <laughs> viewers do. That's the we always do. <laughs> that's the original uh, uh, vintage festival, and that's Charles on the far left and his bride, Francesca, and then a couple uh, other people there. Um, and then you could see that that's me and my siblings. That's a little harder to catch, but uh, we're kind of do our best as little kids. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about perseverance. You and I shared this conversation a few times but have a look at this this these are all the bottles or samples of bottles from pre-prohibition oh, that, that are pretty beautiful, amazing really beautiful magnificent stuff. and then what's really interesting is like these pictures up here that is the picture of what was the warehouse in san francisco a few days after the fire the earthquake and then the fire and that's the inside of it so all that stuff that looks like spaghettis spaghetti is is redwood tank uh staves you know the metal things that you see wrapped around modern day barrels that's what all those are they didn't burn but everything else in there did uh so we we have a long history of perseverance and that 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 always reminds us sort of with that picture that we always enjoy like to enjoy what it is we're doing make sure we enjoy what we're doing today because you don't know what tomorrow brings that's gotten <laughs> us this far you know and then uh I'll, I'll walk out here in a second but if you come in you start to see posters of all the music that we've had here because I have a little bit of a music habit. Um, and there's some interesting people that have been here. We have our own little music festival. And then because I'm so inspired by musical artists and the art that they do, we have a fun time with our merch. So you've, you've seen this before, but some nice uh, 
gun bun, psychedelic gun bun hats and merch. You know, when you've been around 160 years, you, you work to stay a little fresh. So here's some other merch. <laughs> yeah, you're staying very current. You're attractive, all those young. <laughs> That's it, you know, I, 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 you know, those who know me know I always, I love a lot of hats. I love my hats. So there's a lot of hats up here, uh, you know, and then I promise, my, of course, my dad would want me to say this. There is wine in our tasting room. It's right there. <laughs> <laughs> I promise we do have wine in here. But anyway, that's a little, that's a little bit of a, uh, of an overview. Of so what Jeff, what, what did make you go into the wine world? I mean, sixth generation, which is phenomenal. What, you know, you study at USC, you're passionate about music. Um, and I know your sister as well. Yeah. Uh, your younger sister is with you too uh, in the winery. What convinced you to want to continue this tradition? Well, you know, I mean, I, uh, you know, because of Wi-Fi, I can't get you out into the field, but I have a very much a passionate connection to our estate vineyard and our location here. And I don't think I probably could have articulated it then, but I had a drawback to that, you know, uh, you know, growing up in it, even though I'm the first to admit that all the forced labor that I did from like age 10 to 18 in ensured that I would never want to really be working in a garden ever again in my life. Yeah. <laughs> well, I did a lot of work, but I still love the place. And thank God my cousin who's with us now is kind of the farmer in the group. But I especially loved, um, it all comes down to the people. You know, we, sure. um, we have a little bit of a French connection in that, in that uh, when I was, you know, 17, 18, when my father had reopened the winery and we were getting momentum, we became the only winery distributed, uh, only California winery distributed by Seagram Chateau and Estates, which wow. in the 70s, you, you, you must know a lot about that company, of they, the, the vision of Seagram's, you probably know more than I do, but what I do know is that in those days, as an 18-year-old in my grandmother's house, when the executives from that company, this was a company based in New York that take class, basically they they own the distribution market for classified growth French wine. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Yep. Um, and exactly. we were a, a little estate winery in, in Sonoma. And as an 18 year old, I'd get to sit around our family table with these very sophisticated French vignerons and the people that sold their wines. And I mean, in those days, they, you know, the, the, uh, you know, Margot was expensive at $30 you know, or, and Petrus maybe have been with $50. It was super expensive, but, but it was the best in the world or so, you know, and, and that was kind of the aspirational place to be in is, and as I sat around that table, I would watch sort of what I loved about my family business combined with a kind of a pursuit of excellence yeah. and all yield something pretty, pretty special where, and, and that was a celebrate celebration of history, celebration of very, very hard work and attention to detail that goes into all fine winemaking. And yet, like separated by oceans and and uh, and, and a large landmass, there was a passion there that was just hard to hard to put your hands around. And what was interesting was that was before I actually got into the like commercial wine world and realized that the farther away you got from the cellar, maybe there was a little more attitude. There was a little more, you know, wine kind of picked up a little bit of baggage that made it a little less uh, accessible to people. You, you know, knowledge. Maybe it was perceived as a prerequisite to enjoyment. And, uh, you know, and I, I, my foundation story was watching that. And so as I got to college and I started to sort of see what was out in the world and that people were really interested in wine, but they were intimidated by it. They were kind of scared. And I was like, wow, they don't really know where I grew up. Um, and uh, it's a, that's a short-ish version of a pretty long story. It took me a while, but ultimately it came down to the people that I grew up who knowing who made it yeah. and then the people I got to see enjoy it and how it all worked together. And that's keeps me going every day to this day. And what part of the, the business did you like the most were you really sucked in by? You know, the, the pursuit of excellence, you know, and, and it not as, you know, I've always been a little bit more of a coach than, than a player, but, but so in recognizing you know, that there are so many components that go into a great wine and that there's no such thing as like, you know, honestly, you don't buy into it. You don't, you can't like walk into it. You can't, you have to, there's so much realness and experience based, uh, you know, uh, work and, and trial and tribulation that goes into it. And so I, it was honestly like this idea that you, 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 you were going up against almost the windmill every vintage. 
you know, and you were trying to get that windmill. And I, and I, you know, for my first 15 years here, I thought I was going to get to that windmill eventually. But now I realize it's my whole life's work is to try to get to that windmill of the perfect wine. That's fantastic inspirational. What, what do you see, in fact, as the vision of where you are in terms of a region and where do you see it going? Because you've participated for it for the last 160 years. What's your view of it? Well, I think, you know, starting kind of at the, at the, at the, at the overview, 30,000 feet, I think that what makes, uh, what makes it the most fun for me, and I'm going to guess, you know, you, you, we share a, a lot of history and a lot of, uh, a lot of parallel, parallel sort of stages in life. But what I love about the industry right now is how so many people are interested in it that uh, it's, not, it's, it's accessible to you know, most anybody that wants to. And all of a sudden, the stuff that is, you know, been part of our life forever, but maybe not the sexiest because it's been here so long. People are interested in the story and, and the stuff that, that, that goes into the wine. And I think that, um, so as a, as a producer, looking at a, at a consumer base, it seems a lot more accessible and interested in kind of what, what we bring to the table, so to speak, than it has been. And then, you know, I think, that it becomes an open question. I, I am a, a big believer in the quality of California, as are you. And I think that, like everyone else, we're kind of waking up to the fact that, that that's not stagnant, right? That that, that that definition of quality, which always has been a little bit of a, a pursuit, um, you know, the windmill chasing. Well, as the, as the climate changes and as things evolve, the windmill itself starts to move a bit. And it adds another layer of, of kind of fun and interest if you can get away from the scary part. But, you know, for instance, we, you know, Buena Vista and us, we're in a relatively what historically was a cool region. You talked about visiting California and you're in your youth. And, you know, that was when this was a lot cooler. And that's why Carneros, you know, hang its hat on beautiful wines like this, beautiful Chardonnay and Pinot grapes. And all of a sudden we see that heat kind of creeping down and places that never were, uh, it's a little scary, yes, but all of a sudden now things are tasting pretty amazing and getting fully ripe here that we used to not be able to do and, and that becomes exciting. So I'm, I'm bullish, I always am, I always will be, but I'm also biased, I'll give you that right there. <laughs> well, so you see even a benefit to the climate change for Sonoma. You know, I, I think so, I mean, I think, yes, I think, you know, it, it's assuming that, you know, it gives us a little more I think from a wine quality standpoint, there's no question. I mean, it might, it might, it might uh, take a knock out of some of our, you know, Pinot and Chard that's were planted in marginally warm areas that are now real warm. Um, but I think all in all, I just see wines getting better and better. Um, and, and I think that where the cultural winemaking sort of expertise comes in, I used to, there was a period in Sonoma, you know, we share this history of, uh, of our neighborhood here. And it's the longest, it's the old, it's the longest established winemaking region in California. People making wine here, not only since the 1850s, but even in sort of the early seventies and eighties, this was a pioneering spot for people like Richard Arrowood and people like uh, Sonoma Cotrere and pe the Hanzels. Like we have a region of history here where there, there was a lot of innovation. And then I, I think that what happened, you know, in the eight, 90s to early 2000s is a lot of the young energy that I believe in so much in anything to bring in new blood, you know, because everything was so established here. There wasn't a lot of like custom winemaking facilities. You sort of had to be born into it or buy into it. Um, you didn't find a lot of young, ambitious winemakers here trying to swing it out. And I was worried about that for a minute, but that's changed. Now, all of a sudden, there's a ton of great young winemakers down here, you know, renting barrel space here written uh, winery down on 8th street which is our little neighborhood area and i'm a big believer in that and seeing that come back in i mean the sky's the limit because there's a ton and, of more great wine to make here hey, so how do you account the fact that sonoma is really and it's very true the springboard of innovation and entrepreneurship even more than napa i mean the prime example is you know charles krug as an example was working at buena vista and then he went to Napa in 1861, and the count gave him the cuttings of cab. And yeah. as you said, your family started and so many great people. Why is Sonoma such, um, having such an entrepreneurial vibe, do you think? 
Well, accessibility, probably. I mean, I think the, the, the blessing and the curse of Napa at the same time is those wines, you know, historically, and I'm talking primarily Cabernet in the, in the, in the heart of the valley. I was up there uh, on Sunday looking at a vineyard yesterday. Um, yeah. You know, they got the blessing and curse of being sort of recognized as incredible, almost, you know, out of the gate and world class and, and really was a, you know, a, 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 it, it, it was a, it was a, I, this is one person's perspective. I'm sure you could do a whole show on it, but really the pursuit of excellence in Napa really went to one varietal kind of in one region, really dive deep. And we all know that's, that's worthy. And that takes a lot of time and energy and a, eventually it got into the place I think where you, you know, it was expensive to experiment really in that universe. you had to stay within lanes. Sonoma is so much bigger so much more diverse and i don't necessarily mean that in a in a positive way although i yeah. like it but there's urban areas there's coastal areas there's mountain areas there's uh so you could you could get in here and there wasn't as much of a pressure to like only make one no one ever gonna say why are you planning this here you know i i look at this uh we, we haven't had it yet but like the french columbard well I'm let's sure do it you, for it. i'm sure let's do it i'm sure that if you planted this in rutherford you know, people would spin their head around three times. What are you doing planning this in Rutherford? And in Sonoma, mm -hmm. you know, you can kind of do what you want a little bit and figure it out. And that may be stereotyping, but that's a little bit my observation. Very true. And this is exciting to have this diverse region that is Sonoma. What, what is the future, do you think, of Sonoma? And should Sonoma eventually focus more on certain great varieties by area? Or do you think the path Sonoma is on is, is the right one. I know it's a very deep question as we taste well, the French Colombard. It's it's my you know it's my life's work to try to answer that question because from a you know from a marketing standpoint, if we're going to talk about like I, I think of uh, your home country and I think of Clovujo, what a great vineyard that is, and and you know way more about that than I do. But I remember being a young vintner there and realizing it's. 200 acres which makes it giant in that neighborhood but there are 90 owners in that 200 acres and they each own rows and so you have the benefit if you're like selling Clos Vougeau as a as a wine as a as an origin of 90 or whatever the owners very smart people telling their own stories about the same spot over and That's over right. and how does that not become like a message that we all want and wines that we all want to drink that has to turn into that and our, and I think that so from a trying to pigeonhole Sonoma into that kind of focus is very hard to do because there's stuff everywhere. So as a marketer, it's a little hard, but as a wine drinker, you know, or in a curious winemaker, it's beautiful because, you know, you can really find little pockets of weather and pockets of soil and pockets of, uh, of, of terroir that make a lot of stuff possible here. And that's, that's been attractive, you know, especially our part of Sonoma. Um, we don't, you know, we don't have a, a huge number of varietals. We've honed ourselves in and focused. Um, and, and I like that a lot, but, uh, that's probably, it's a yin yang in terms of the whole County because it's big and it's diverse. And what is as Goudelage Bunshu, your, your favorite grape varieties to, to work with? Well, Cabernet, I mean, Bo the Bordeaux, how we, we, we planted Cabernet. My father insisted and, and, uh, I, I don't have a map in front of me. You mentioned Carneros. We literally border Carneros on the, on the Southern part of our property across yeah. the street. In fact, he was on the, the, the panel that created Carneros and opted to keep us out of it. Sometimes I kick him for that on our lower section of our vineyard, but he did that because he passionately felt that our vineyard, which is up against, I can at least point up here. Um, there's like a, you can see there's a mountain up there. You can't see the vineyard, but that, uh, that's, Oh, well, there's a better spot. Bear with me. That's a beautiful image. Look at this winery. I'm going to walk up here and maybe Gorgeous. you'll get to see the top of Arrowhead Mountain here or very close to it through well, our stage. I don't tour. want to go too far. But, but if you, that looks, it's hard to you to tell, but that's a, a half a mile away and maybe 800 feet in elevation. And our vineyard goes from the south of that peak. And he knew instinctively that the exposure um, facing south, the soil type, which was all this, uh, ash from the volcano and types, instead of typical Carneros clay was going to yield better Cabernet and ripe Cabernet. And so he planted Cabernet there in the early 70s. 
And we've been chasing that ever since. It's the most unusual place to grow Cabernet in New World, California, at least it historically was. Um, but we were always believers in acidity and structure and mouthfeel and, uh, and it delivers. I mean, the, and that's why the wind is a little bit in our back when it comes to the warm weather. We're, you know, we're hitting more maturity evenly, more consistently now, but it's what we do. And I love it every year. It's great to do it. <laughs> so Jeff, what you, 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 obviously we selected passion for you because you're so passionate. We wanted to have a French color bar because you love to dive into history and some of the first yes. coming in, but so, what, go ahead. Sorry, Josh. Yeah. No, no, te, describe us the wine. You're the expert. You're Mr. Mr. Sonoma. <laughs> and this is obviously a great vineyard. And uh, we had to bring a little bit of our French background here just to bring I, 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 I really enjoy this wine. So why don't you, I mean, basically it's very dry, yeah. very fresh. Uh, you know, those are two words that we love to use to describe any white wines that we drink or try to make here. So, um, but French Columbard is a, uh, that is an, what we would call an OG varietal in, in, in not only in Sonoma, but in all of California, here's you for not pulling it out. Get, what's the story with this vineyard and how do you have these grapes? Well, we're very fortunate. We've had them for a long time, but what I, I wanted to ask you, Jeff, besides even the wine, you're an innovator yourself. We just looked at your tasting room, bring history and then great t-shirts, great hats, great merchandise, very cool musician. What do you think of the screw cap? Uh, I like it. I have to tell you, I, I was a slow adopter. I'm, I am a, uh, it's funny because our marketing team has a hard time with this as traditional. I'm a pretty traditionalist when it comes to wine. It probably harkens back to those days sitting around the table with the, with the C&E people, the Chateau and Estates people. Um, and so I'm a big believer in all things technology and all things progress forward, but I'm not a believer in being on the bleeding edge. And so when screw caps came out at first, I was a little leery of, uh, of the quality impact, um, a little bit on the presentation, but not, I don't get caught up in that too much. Now I'm a big fan of it. We have it on a number of our wines um, and we, we just got a blowing line that can do it ourselves. So we're probably going to move a little bit. Anything like this where aging isn't uh, needed or expected uh, and crispness is, it makes, you know, it makes the quality of the wine good. And then, God forbid, I actually think about the customer, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, how many, I mean, how easy is it? Not only for anybody at home, but for the sommeliers and the people that have to, you know, move a lot of wine quick. It just makes, why not have it, you know, as far as I'm concerned. Totally agree. So, so I, I have no problem with the screw cap. Well, thank you, Jeff. So before we move to your other fantastic room, what... Yeah. Tell us, as Jeff Buncher, what inspires you, Jeff? Because you, you, you're such a wealth of information on California. You represent so well the family and the van from the last 160 plus years. What, what drives you yourself? You know, it's a, it's, I, I said it before, and it's really the people. And I guess yeah. by that, I mean my own family as we were in families and our families grow and evolve. So there's the people that used to be little people are now big people with their own ideas and are, are inspiring my own kids, uh, my cousins that are in the business. Um, you know, seeing, uh, seeing the world through young people's eyes continually keeps me optimistic. And I'm sort of lucky enough that I've been doing that forever and I hope to be that way. Um, and that really, stands true in life in general, but also in the wine business. If you want to, you know, there's, everybody's been knocked a little bit by this year. You know, how can you not be? You're waving around, but if you, you know, there's there's a lot of winemakers, a lot of young winemakers out there that are, you know, that are sad, but they're also looking for the next opportunity. They're sort of bouncing around and they, uh, you know, they have new energy and you put that together, you know, as families get to do with some of us that are longer in the tooth that can say yeah. that you can make it through this becomes a magic, a magic combination, you know, and so it's people. So as you make wine, Jeff, do you listen to music? Does your grape listen to music? Because I know you're quite the musician and you promote a lot of artists in your winery as well. 
So we, when uh, did the Bunshu grape listen to? <laughs> you know, uh, the grapes sort of get the, get the ambient sound of the universe. And I am a big believer in ambient sound. Um, and I like everything but sirens. Sirens I don't like, but anything else I like that's out in the world. Um, but yeah, there's no question that there's music playing all the time in the cellar. Um, uh, always, you know, in the office that I'm working at, if, you know, in a way that doesn't upset everyone else. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just a big believer music enhances everything. And I've even gone down the rabbit hole, um, as you know, uh, and, and tested once upon a time the impact that music has on the flavors you, you experience. And there's a definite cause effect thing there. It's a little bit deeper and not everyone, there's our, everyone needs to think about what kind of music they need to pair with their wine. But I can tell you from firsthand experience that it does have an impact, you know, what you're listening to, if you bother to let your senses take over your whole universe there. Um, so uh, generally speaking, as long as we're not, I'm not even really too picky. Any music is good music for the most part. So you want to show us now your music studio? Shall yeah, we go we'll, 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 we'll move up to the, uh, to our TV studio that we built uh, because we were getting bands to come up and do little uh, acoustic things. And then we turned it into during the pandemic, a nice little spot. So if you give me a minute, I'll get up there. And, uh, and I think we have some great Cabernet to try up there too. Absolutely. So I'll see you Let's go right there and try your wine. Jeff. You've climbed a few steps, as I could see. Voila! I believe that's uh, EC. I believe that's what you might say. <laughs> so voilà. we are, uh, I moved over a, a few hundred yards. Uh, the back of the winery is over there. I drove down into the family side of the property. We're looking at uh, some Merlot, two Merlot blocks here behind me. And we're in this, uh, what we call affectionately on site, Casa Dracula. Uh, it's uh -huh. called the Dracula house forever. And we need to change it to something a little more inviting. but. We'll leave it at that. But what we did uh, during the pandemic, do some, it actually predates the pandemic. We converted into a TV studio and, during the pandemic. But what we did before was we do a lot of music shows at the winery here. And uh, we invited some great musicians to come and do acoustic sets in our little studio. So we turned this, you know, Shangri-La, which if, you, if my parents... When they heard that we were going to do this in this old building, they couldn't believe it. Like a studio, they thought, you know, because it, more, more four-legged critters lived in it than two-legged critters for a long time, if you get my drift. Um, but we cleaned it up, and now we're going to we're, we'll taste a little wine in here, but I'll walk in. Um, I'll walk, I'm going to turn around and walk backwards. So we're, we're basically going into Casa Dracula, and we put, put some pictures up there. Um, that's Sam from Iron and Wine, and you know, not only is his name Iron and Wine, if you don't know him, he's awesome, but look at that, there's even a wine glass on his, on his, uh, on his, on his perch. We don't really ask people to do that, they do it if they want. That's a famous Swedish singer named Miki Lee um, that played our amphitheater. That's a, a great songwriter by the name of Cass McCombs, uh, a great duo. I don't know what her name is. She just looks really good. Up there is Lucius, which is a duo that has been all over. These four musicians now are, you can see a lot of them online because they're not touring. Uh, one of my favorites that the kids all like is this guy, Mac DeMarco right here. He does like wine and his, uh, his cigarillos as well. Um, you know, and then we get a couple people. I'm a big fan of up and coming artists that are trying to make it. We get a couple people that people have heard of before. That's uh, Chris Robinson uh, from the Black Crows, if you guys know who that is. We have a few yeah. people like that. Um, but in general, you know, I think we were talking off offline that one of the things I think we share about uh, the business that we're in is that it's really fun to, to do things where we can share wine and share with people doing things that they love, uh, right. being with people they love. And for me, music's a big part of that. So it wasn't a big arm twist for me to like take a few spaces here and could turn them into performance areas. So how did music come back such a part, came as such a part of your life? Because this is amazing. It's so well intertwined with the wines and, and you know, it was, uh, it was, it was, a, it was a, it was an 80 year old woman now that uh, maybe she was, maybe I'm, maybe I'm penalizing her. Maybe she was 75 and this was maybe 15 years ago. And it was at a uh, executive seminar and she, I was lucky enough to be a part with a bunch of other winemakers that were much more successful in season than I was. And I was the young guy, maybe the only one in Sonoma, from Sonoma at that matter. And, and 
she didn't know anything about my history. She didn't know that I was in a band in college. She didn't know that I still have a lot of friends in that space, um, that I, I, I had opted to come home. You know, I, my passion is definitely my family and my space here. Um, but, uh, but I did leave some, I did leave some music behind when I left Los Angeles to come up here. Um, and I was also, you know, looking for ways to make a 116 year old winery be, you know, kind of relevant in the context yeah. of the wine world. It sounds crazy that you couldn't be having a history like that. But in those days, I was more interested in talking about where I was going as opposed to where I'd been. And this woman, I took some sort of test, Myers-Briggs, I don't know what it was, but this woman who I now know must have been some sort of a, a future seer, like looked at me and said, you need music in your life for real. And I, and, I, and, I, and I still play a lot of music. I had played, but she goes, no, you really need it. And this was at a time 15 years ago or so where I was, I needed a little kick in the pants. And, you know, I thought about it and I thought, well, I really, you know, I love music, but I really love young, I really love people creating new music. So I sort of love that zone and anything. I like, I mentioned it before. I like young people doing anything inter interesting. And, and uh, so I wanted to see if I could get younger bands that maybe didn't have household names, but the quality very, was very high to come up and play. And, uh, and I was hoping they'd bring their parents because I didn't know if they'd drink wine or not. Um, and luckily the kids drank it. I mean, they were old enough. I call them kids. They were in their twenties and their parents came. And you know, what came after a few Bands took a chance with me and rerouted tours between on the West Coast to include our little old barn here. Um, I partnered up once I figured out we needed to do it. You know, there were people doing this for a living and I wasn't. I partnered up with a friend and then together we built a pretty good project here. But, uh, you know, it's all based on the, the fundamentals of hospitality that we take for granted. I think, you know, be nice to people, share your wares, your home, my home and uh, it didn't take us too long before musicians started to like coming to play here. And, and uh, you know, it's been a great source of inspiration and been fun for us ever since. And you play with them sometimes, right? No, I, I, uh, I've been invited a lot, but I, I keep my, my playing. Uh, I have come out of the shower occasionally, but, uh, but in terms of like, uh, you know, I, I, it's interesting. It's, it's, I haven't been, I haven't gotten myself on stage yet. I might at some point, but the, uh, well, I'm a big believer. On stage. Well, what, what's a big believer when I'm a, and this, I, I wasn't very popular in my town of Sonoma because, um, because I didn't put the local bands up because I was like, I was very much into wanting to get people who were pursuing it for their lives all yeah. in, you know, all in. And, and, uh, and invariably, you, you know, it's kind of like wine, you know, you, 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 you can tell the people who are all in and when they make wine versus, versus great hobbyists that sort of do it as a weekend. And that's no knock on hobbyists, but uh, it's a reason they're not waking up thinking about it every day. And, and I wanted to showcase young musicians that really had kind of thrown it all out there. Um, and, and it's, and, and, uh, and it shows in the quality and that's sort of how we, how we've done it. So that, so that keeps me from getting on there because I, I fully fall into the other category. <laughs> but this is great. Congratulations. Because you're bringing so, such exciting vibration to Sonoma and youth and excitement and different music. And as we serve the cab, we should serve your Cabernet as well. And I'll, I, you know, we, we, we both should talk about each of the Cabernets as well. You know, you got to tell us the great story that you shared with me with Metallica. What happened? Yes. <laughs> so uh, full disclosure, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to just suffer with Buena Vista only. I left my Cabernet in the winery, so I'm gonna be up here. I don't think I'm gonna suffer too bad though. It's delicious. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, but we want to make sure that everybody who is interested in the Gunlash Bunshu wines go on the website. And yes. the wine you were going to present was your great cab. It was a cab. We, we make a number of Cabernets and we were going to show our, uh, I was going to sip on my estate there. Um, and I'm sitting, I'm, this is a, so let's, I'll get to Metallica in a second, John Charles. But since I have this in the glass, what are we drinking here? Well, this is the private reserve from Buena Vista. So this is one of the finest Cabernet, although we've created since then the Chateau private reserve as well. But this is very exciting because this is really exactly what you were talking about. A lot of people told me specifically and, and 
a few of us, oh, Cabernet does not really blossom the way you'd like it. Here in Sonoma, and we started to taste some amazing wines and yours included, of course, and great vineyard. And we said, we got to do a phenomenal cap from, from this area. And here we go. That's the result. So very small production, 200 cases only, prominently sold at the winery. That's it. And this is our representation of that soft, elegant, and 60-day long cold soak and fermentation of, of caps. So this is 100% Cabernet from Buena Vista. But it you should delicious. describe yours. You've got it to is, describe yours. Well, it, they share a lot of similarity, and they're both um, a little bit uh, – they are they're, they're both have some body to them. It's not just a, a bright red fruit. We always – I look at things in terms of balance and in terms of sort of dark fruit and red fruit, dark fruit being currants and plums and to, you know, tobacco is not a fruit, but you know where I'm going. And then there's red fruit, kind of bright red cherries, maraschino cherries. Um, and uh, what I've always liked about the cooler side of Sonoma when it's done right is you get a lot of that black fruit as opposed just to the overt red. And there's a lot in this. It's very, the tannins are very well balanced and essentially it's, fairly reminiscent. I think that the, um, it's funny, I was just at, at the, uh, I mentioned that I, uh, that I'd been in a vineyard looking at a vineyard and, uh, on the Rutherford crossroad there. So yeah. con, you know, right the heart of Napa. And, uh, we're over there looking at some grapes that, you know, it's a, it's a tough year, but there's a few that, that are a little, it's a chance for us to walk around vineyards that have fruit on the vine still. And so I never really walked through the heart of Napa before a Napa cab vineyard. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting for me to see because I'm a, I, 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 I'm a big believer in what Sonoma can do. And, and that didn't really change, change my opinion too much, being on the valley floor down there. I think you have to find areas that are a little more on the slope. You know, you have to find stuff that works a little harder to grow. Um, the yields, I'm sure, I don't know where this is grown, but I'm sure they're nothing comparable to some of that rich Napa Valley, valley floor where the yields are so high down there. That's uh, very interesting. So, um, you know, I came home pretty optimistic about my life's work, which I guess is good. <laughs> so we can <laughs> expect uh, a, that. A, a Jeff Bunshu, Gunlash Bunshu Cabernet from Napa Valley soon. Well, you know, I'm not opposed to it. I have a lot of friends that make uh, really good wines there. And our executive winemaker, Keith Emerson, um, is, uh, you know, he makes wine at a great vineyard up there called Vineyard 29 in, in St. Helena. He's, so he, we know the, vi we know those vineyards very well. My cousin just came back to work. He spent a half a career there. So it's not, a, I'm not opposed to it. You know, uh, if I can find the vineyard, I like, uh, you know, but there's still some work to do over here as well. This For is sure. delicious, Jean Charles. Well, Congratulations. Thank you, Jeff. So Jeff, personal question. What is your dream? See, I could see in the chat, there's a lot of, People very interested in your vision as well of the future. What is your, what is so, your dream? Not just the winery, but yours. No, but I mean, I honestly, I, I, dream, I used to have a real catchy, true answer to this. I wanted Mud Honey, this band from this grunge band from Seattle that was famous when I was a kid, when I was younger. I wanted, I wanted Mud Honey to play in my barn, and I wanted a hundred point wine from Robert Parker, and. <laughs> I got a, I got mud honey to play and I got 98 points, which I'll take as a hundred. And so well done. Ever, ever since that's happened, uh, you know, I'm kind of reformulated. I'm, it's, kind of, it's kind of a day by day thing, you know? Uh, so that, that, cause it came true. <laughs> Who knew? So, uh, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, I'm a sixth generation vendor and also I haven't pre-thought this cause I haven't, I haven't thought about this. No one's asked me this, but I think that when I started, I probably paid more attention to succession than I did to business. I was so interested in retaining what my family had built, the spirit, not the, not the, not the income, but the spirit, of course, the, the, the land um, that I focused a lot on that and not as much on the business side. And I, and I, eventually I got around to business, but in those early years, I, I kind of thought through, well, you know, you're a multi, it's, I, we're not a family that makes our kids do anything. So you sort of have to be lucky enough to have a kid that wants to do it. And, and my parents were lucky enough that they had me and I definitely have been into it, but I know that my kids may not. And I've always thought, well, if I can hold on to it, 
you know, in family ownership for two successor generations after me so that maybe my grandkids, my kids don't want to do it. So I have this goal that the winery is still in my family's hands when my youngest daughter, who's now 18, is 62 years old. <laughs> That's amazing. And, and, you know, I think uh, I'm starting to allow myself to think that that could happen because it's just, you know, you, you, we, we don't take anything for granted here and you never know. We have a great history, but, uh, you know, like I showed you those pictures, it could change. So that, that's, that's a goal for me. That's a dream. Well, d d tell us, how is it, by the way, you brought in your sister, part of your team now, which yes. I was delighted to see. So how is it to, to work with your sister as a family business? It was, you know, it, she was a gift when she came back. It was a gift for me to have her come back, um, And my, I should say my brother is here too. He was, in fact, I think he came afterwards. So for a while, for a long while there, it was me, uh, you know, fighting those windmills on my own. And, uh, and that's not really, a, that's not a true statement at all because we're only really as good as the people that work here. Yeah. But we take a lot of, we hold a lot of, you know, I'm sure you do too. Everybody who works around here is like family. So everybody matters and there's a lot of, If you, if you ask me what the pressure is of the business, it's mostly making sure that everyone who works here can feel good about working here and go home and feed their family. That's by far the, the number one goal. And having someone to take that kind of position and share that with besides my father and me was really a, a blessing. Um, and so, you know, having her as a part of that team has been great. And it's, it was a great energy for people that worked here. And then more, more recently, my cousin Toll Merritt uh, just came back after a long uh, long career managing lots of vineyards on the Napa side. And now he's, he's here working with us at our new, new winery and new production facility. And, um, and it's a, you know, it's a magic thing because uh, I think it's funny to say this and, and I'm probably talking to one of the few people on the planet that can relate to it, but you know, you, uh, you, you, the family heritage thing, it, 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 it you know, you, you, you don't know why it inspires people. If you're like, for me, I'm in the middle of it. And I know my family story inspires people, both that I work with and people that buy our wine. And I don't understand why, you know, it's just what we've always had. And so it's taken me a bit to grow into the fact that it really can mean so much to people. And, and since I figured that out, I cherish it with my heart. And I also think that it makes a, you know, a, Uh, a Boisset family or a Bunchy family that much stronger because it's so connected. We're, you know, that we're, that's our roots and we're, yeah. we're in. Well, congratulations. What a legacy you're building. And you eventually anticipate your kids to go into it, but they're very young still. How old are they? They are. I, 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 I'm not sure. I, I hope that, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that like either they or their kids eventually will go into it. You know, I'm, uh, I, that's a hope. It's not necessarily an expectation, but, uh, because I would never want them, but it'd be nice if it happened. Um, and you know, and then we'll see where it goes. Luckily my cousin has a few kids, so you never know. <laughs> so Jeff, you've been amazing and obviously an incredible inspiration. What a family legacy, what a history. Um, you've done so much for your business. Now, what message do you think you would have for others uh, during this time and in general in life and business? Because besides all the things you do from music to wine, you, you have a lot of great advice and you're very wise. You know, the terroir, the roots <laughs> of Sonoma makes you a very grounded individual. So why don't you openly... Give us your thoughts about what you recommend. Well, let, me, let me put on my glass so I can see you because uh, my other glasses. Um, so I'll tell you, uh, I will give you some wisdom, but I'm going to tell you where I got it. I'm starting and, to drink. And, uh, and it was from you. We were, the, your listeners or your fans may not know that, uh, or maybe they do, that you, we were most recently together on a panel at, with wine.com, a great business partner for both of us, I'm sure. And Um, and this is a very true story. Despite all the stuff that you, you just said, I promise this is coming from the heart right back at you because uh, this has been a big year. You know, I was, I was watching a podcast with another winery owner um, talking about, you know, that there have been fires in seven, it's 17, 18, 19, 20. And then, uh, you know, we, we're, all, we're all feeling what's going on this year. 
And we were on a panel, you and I, along with the great Wente family and, and my family. Um, and it was the reddest day. You know, at those days, I didn't, it, it was the, one of the darkest days of the year. And I <laughs> commented, I don't know if I said it on the podcast or whatever, or if I said it outside, but like, I'm generally pretty optimistic and I'm a kind of a, a breakthrough and keep going no matter what. And uh, that red day, the day the sun never came up, I think it was, it really shook me. And I can even say, you know, lucky me because I'm not as connected and close to the glass fire more recently, which has happened since that even still that day was the one where it was like, Whoa, the world is definitely different. And you said something in that to the rest of us that I'll repeat as like a piece of, you know, sort of something to remember. And it's really the provenance, I think, of people that are like us that have families that have been at it a long time and seen a lot. And it was that, look, you know, we are experiencing an intense bit of discomfort that's right in front of our face. But if you look in the context of our families, and some of us have families that have everyone knows about these histories, some of us don't have those histories, but we can all know that they all went through trials and tribulations, whether they were famous or not. And they all got us as individuals to where we are. And that this, we will get through as well. And then you also did something which I loved, which was to step back and, you know, when our family, we say, you know, always look for the lemonade and the lemons and talking about the fact that yeah. for those of us that, you know, that live with a product that by definition is slow, that by definition, like we can't like put into, we can't put into ones and zeros and put it through the machines and get it to you immediately. Then we have to wait for grapes to ripen and we have to like, we can't speed stuff up. It just happens that way that we sort of, whether or not we want to, and sometimes we don't want to, we want it to be faster. We're stuck to like let stuff evolve. And, and we also know that's where the fabric of life happens. Sitting at the tailgate in the vineyard or around the fa- family table talking about stuff. And that you pointed out so wisely that in this environment, there's been more of that happening. There's been more of us slowing down and yeah. seeing really what life is about. And, uh, and I really thank you for that. And that's why I'm, I'm rebroadcasting it out there because it really, <laughs> it was a great, it was a great, like sort of a good, nice kick in the pants for me as a, as a brother, like remember, and you, and you, 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 uh, you so articulately said it, but I really do believe that just take a deep breath, cherish the beauty, beautiful parts. Cause they are still here. It's so easy to look at the other stuff, but I tell you the beautiful stuff's right next to us, probably in your right. family or who you're sitting next to it every night. So here's to you and here's to that. That's my inspiration. Right back wow. at you, John Charles. You're giving me goosebumps. <laughs> me, well, by the way, your beautiful speech at the Smithsonian Museum. Do you remember maybe, shall we close on that? And you want to say what we were doing there? Because it was quite a historical moment talking about the families you just mentioned, plus a few others. We were together. Maybe you yeah. say a few, few seconds about that great experience together. Well, we got lucky that... Um, it was, a, I guess, what was happening. The history of wine was being uh, introduced into the Smithsonian. And somehow, uh, we got invited to that. And I, you know, I don't spend a lot of time east of, really, Weinberg here, Sonoma, let alone in the nation's capital. And that was a room full of, you know, great people and, and, uh, and great service givers and people who were passionate about food and wine and history. And um, it was it was an honor and a privilege and a little bit awe-inspiring to be included in that. I believe it was the, um, was it a Julia Childs uh, uh, sort of yeah. w- inspired by sort of her memoirs and a big, you know, you remember being there. Was, the kitchen uh, and the demonstration kitchen and all of yeah. that, which is amazing. Exactly. And you, you delivered quite a speech on the history of California. I loved it. Well, I am, uh, you know, I think, you know, I'm obviously, I'm, I'm a fan of California and I remain one. Um, and I know you are too. Um, and, I, and I think that that's another reason I appreciate all your words because those of us that have been here a long time forever, you, it's easy to, you know, there's some, there's a lot of people leaving, but boy, there's, there's really no reason, you know, if you're getting, yeah, like, I really think there's so much going on here. That's good in life and in wine that uh, there's something for everybody. I totally agree. And Jeff, I cannot wait. Till our next show, we're going to do it together in person in your caves. 
And we'll, was, go, we'll do good Lash Bunshu Caves, Buena Vista Caves, and we'll walk because we are neighbors. We'll walk with a bottle of beautiful Cabernet from your estates, and we'll talk wine and vision and history and legacy and the future of California. Do we have a date? We I, we absolutely do, Jean Charles. As long as we start here, because it's downhill, we can walk down. We we, we won't get tired walking down. It'll be perfect. Otherwise, we'll have to. But yes, it'll be great. And uh, and thank you for having me. It's a big honor. Um, you know, you have some great people on the show. I'm I'm honored to be included. And congratulations to you and all the success with Buena Vista and everything else that you're doing. Well, and to you and you've you've been a true inspiration and representing such a family legacy so well and being such an ambassador of America and California and really welcoming, and I need to say that to everyone, little immigrants like me, as your great, great, great grandfather came, you open your arms the first time I came to Buena Vista and say, come over, and I will never forget. So, Jeff, thank you so much. To thank the, you, John Charles, and thank you, family. Your team. Here's the family. I'll see you in person next time, I hope. Okay, bye-bye. No, so, Jeff, what about the Metallica story you never told us. Well, um, that's what I, you know, uh, that's, I've always said to my family and to my people here, just keep your head up. You never know what's going to come your way, even in a pandemic. And lo and behold, um, a guy that I met a long time ago when I was learning about the music business showed up for a wine event here. And when I heard he was a music guy, I, I, I took the tour myself trying to educate. And it turned out he wasn't an indie young music guy. He's a guy that had been working with some of the biggest bands in America as a, as a manager. And uh, we became friends. And then through him, I met a, uh, strangely, another. And, he, and he'd worked among the bands he worked for. It was a, a couple small bands, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Metallica, Eric Church, little baby bands, you know, it'd be facetious. Um, and then, it, and then his partner, who was the, also a manager of Metallica, uh, came to a couple shows here, or came to a show here um, while he was working with the band, which is located in Northern California. He came to see a band we had here, uh, Television, a great old band from New York City. And his name was Mark. And because of Mark and Tony, these two guys that are part of that band's family for a long time, uh, I don't, I, don't, I don't know anybody in that band. I, uh, one, uh, Kurt has, lives in Sonoma or has a house in Sonoma, the guitar player. So they were always ubiquitous. And because I'm, because I'm me, I was like, well, I guess I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if they would play here because we demonstrated we could. But I, I would say it would probably take a pandemic or something, but it could happen. And lo and behold, <laughs> we, had, we had a pandemic and they got approached uh, to shoot a show for a drive-in concert and you know and basically in the in they went and you guys can appreciate this you and your team it took them 28 days from saying yes to filming it to releasing it and it ultimately was a live concert shot here on our property with uh about five of us that weren't part of their crew and just the crew um, that then got played in, you know, 300 drive-in theaters around North America. Oh. And <laughs> it translated into my wife, Liz, and me with our own private Metallica concert. It was unbelievable. Well, I drink to this. Congratulations, Jeff. Well, Ms. thank Metallica you. and Jeff Bunchu. Hey, there we go. Thank you so much, John Charles. Thank you. Well, great story. Very cool. Perfect. Well, Jeff, thank you so much. All right, well, keep me posted. Awesome. When you're over, uh, when you're over next door, keep me posted. I'd love to come say hey, and uh, and maybe I'll see. Uh, are you at? Uh, are you where are you at Raymond right now, or are you at Oakville? Yes, exactly. Raymond. We're at Raymond. Yeah, yeah. I we talked. Have... To, I talked. To, I want to see the Oakville tasting room too. I'm so. I was saying to Walter that I'm so excited about the program there. Yeah, you, uh, you got to get some wine in there because we we want to buy your wine and uh, promote them both in Hillsburg. And here in Napa, so you let us know so we can call them. He called, and so we talked about that. But I'm, I'm also just, uh, I'm really glad you got that. That's a great, that's a great space. It's got a, it's pretty exciting that you, that's yours. Well, it's the oldest wine store, as you know, in Northern Cal, 1881. Can you imagine the first one who sold wine at the time, food and mercantiles.